We are in chapter 4, going to be in verses 7 through 16 this morning. And uh, the title I picked for this message is Christ's Body in the World, which is maybe sounds a little bit unusual, but I think it'll make sense by the time we work through this. Um, this past week, I got to do one of my favorite things to do in this world. Uh, twice on Monday and on Wednesday, went for hikes Monday with the gears and the galls went up to to uh, Lake Cushman area and staircase, hiked around a while there, and then uh, Wednesday went with David Bragg and, and Donald Wentworth up to uh, Snow Lake off the Snoqualmie Pass and hiked up there for a while. And and both days, I was uh, I felt really refreshed by being out there, and for one thing, just kind of being disconnected from this crazy world uh, was nice. And, and, and one of the parts of it, I mean, it's kind of a, I don't know, spiritual type experience, at least it is for me. And being out there, it's peaceful and enjoying creation, which this time of year especially is, is so beautiful, breathtaking. The uh, trip to Snow Lake there, I mean, when we get up to the top and where the lake is, initially it was kind of overcast and still enjoying the, the scenery around there. But then as the day went on, the clouds kind of burned off and fog burned off and it was just amazing. And you get to see the turquoise colored water and green, I mean, the, the rich green trees. And, you know, it's like, um, this is what I, this is what I was thinking of the other day. It's like if you could walk around in a Bob Ross painting, it's kind of like that. Remember that guy? I know you watched that guy. So the happy little trees, they were everywhere up there. Um, and so you're, you know, you're, you are enjoying, when you're doing that, you're enjoying creation and you're not seeing God or hearing God. You're not experiencing God with your, your natural senses. At least you're not experiencing him in your, with your natural senses, like directly, but I mean, you're experiencing his good gifts and and so it was a great it was a great blessing to do that. It's again one of my favorite things to do. I don't think I'm ever going to become one of those people that does it all the time, but a couple times a summer I yeah, love getting out there and uh really thankful for it. And as I said I I was thinking about God here and there not not the whole time. Sometimes I was trying to figure out where the heck we were going, right Dave? Uh but we uh again were able to experience that. And I was thinking about God and and his creativity and the variety of of his creation and just how rich that experience was and if we asked ourselves like what is god what is god up to in the world how how is god present in the world that he has made we get maybe one part of of that the answer to that question here in the section we're going to look at we're going to look at this idea of of god's involvement in the world god's presence in the world through his people through through us and and understand a little better what that means what what exactly God is up to how he reveals himself and how he how he shares his fullness with with this world so let's read let's read verses 7 through 16 okay 7 through 16 it says but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift so we'll pause there for a second. He, in the last week's study, we looked at the first part of this chapter where he's talking about unity in Christ and how we are all in him and in Christ. We are all partakers of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Everything we need for spiritual life, God has given us. He, he's assured us of his love for us, his mercy toward us. He, is, he has granted us his uh, holiness and blamelessness, and he's redeemed us, he's forgiven us. He's given us an inheritance, an invisible, but also an invaluable inheritance in relationship with him. We have all this, and, and we all have it equally, and we don't have it because of merit. We don't have it because of anything that we did to deserve it. It's unearned favor that God has granted to us, and God has granted to all of us. We all enjoy those benefits of relationship with God because of what Christ has done for us. So that, that's where we were last week. And now he's saying to each one of us, each one of us who are part of this collective whole of the church, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of, of Christ's gift. And by what we look at, what we're going to see here later in the context, it's clear that what he's describing here is, is not only the, the grace of salvation and everything I just 
explained a second ago, but also this this idea that we all have a unique role to play, that we, we all are gifted by God in unique ways, and he is up to things in and through our lives. And, and then it goes on, verse 8, it says, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. So, so here's this idea, like at one time, God through the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, entered the world that he had made. God, big theological terms, God is transcendent. He, he is above that which he created, and in Christ he became God imminent, God here. So God was here in the person of Christ, but Christ left, as we know, thousands of years ago. So he, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He lived in this world, is what I take that to mean. And then it says he ascended. So he, he, he returned to heaven, right, where he is currently, so that we don't see him. We don't hear him with our natural senses. He's up there, okay? And he says, but he, he, has, he has left us here, and he has gifted us here. And it says that he, he led captive a host of captives. And this is a reference to Psalm 68, a Psalm of David, where he celebrates God's redemption of his people, God being king, God being like a warrior who fought for his people. And, and what he did essentially was he took a bunch of captives who were captives to Egypt and captives to other nations, and he made them captives to himself. So he took those who were enslaved and he set them free by, in an ironic twist, enslaving them to himself. And and what we see that's so categorically different about that is to belong to God is to be truly free. And, and unlike other captors, when God takes people captive, he doesn't exploit them. He doesn't take from them. He gives to them. And thus it says, he gave us grace according to the measure of his gifts in verse 7. And in verse 8, he gave gifts to men. You see, this speaks of the character of God, which is, which is drastically different when compared to the character of, of people, the character of your typical human king, human authority figure. Even a, even a human hero, the best of mankind, would still exploit others and take advantage and take from others. And, and here we have a God who who takes these captives and gives to them. And as I said, when God gives to us, he also gives through us. This is part of the the sharing, outward-moving, life-giving character of God. And it says in verse 10, at the end of the verse there, he ascended far above. He left us here. He ascended far above. And then it says, so that he might fill all things. And this will sound familiar for those in Sunday school. We were looking at Ecclesiastes as Don's been teaching through that book. And we talked about how our life experiences, apart from God, are empty. Even even the best of life, sometimes there's an emptiness to it. It's like... um, It's like I was talking about my experience hiking, okay? And and, and the, the Bob Ross idea, right? So you think of like a two-dimensional painting. As impressive as those paintings were and as talented as that guy, the late Bob Ross, I think he passed away years ago, the late Bob Ross, as talented as he was, like the difference between a Bob Ross painting and walking around in the woods and seeing all those sights in 3D I mean, there's a big difference between those two types of experiences, right? Like there's an added dimension, and with that comes a whole lot. Well, if we could jump to the next level, we could say, hey, apart from God, even a great experience, even enjoying the beauty of the, the Cascade Mountain chain or the Olympics or seeing amazing, like the like Snow Lake we get to see and another lake up there too called Gem Lake. I mean, just uh, amazing, beautiful, like I said, so 
so wonderful. And I mean that in the truest sense of the word. Like it's, it's truly, you get an awe, a sense of awe and wonder from being there. It's so gorgeous. But, but like still, there's kind of like this, it's just a, still a fleeting thing. It's still fleeting. You can't stay up there forever. And it's still like the, the, there's just another dimension. And what this is describing is how God is still, he is still active in this world. He is still filling this world, which then begs the question, okay, but how, how, what, what does that mean? How does he do that? How does he take something that's even three-dimensional and the experiences we have with sights and sounds and tastes and all that, like how, what is, what is this added dimension? How is, how is God through Christ still filling the world. How is he filling all things in? And it says he involves us in that. Let's look at that before we answer the question of how he fills all things. Um, it says he involves us. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So there's that idea of fullness again. Fullness, fullness, fullness. And we are involved and there's apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And, and what is it that these, what is it that these people do? What, what do they do? Well, primarily what they do is they speak, they speak words of truth. We, we share truth communicate we convey truth about who god is and the fact that he is the creator and father of all, all the things we've talked about in ephesians the gospel the good news of who jesus is and what jesus accomplished for us and the forgiveness we have in christ and this adoption this fact that we're we're in god's family and we're inseparably bound to god all these great things are communicated through these appointed ministers here to Pass along good news of who God is and good news of God's fullness. Well, now let's, let's dig into that fullness idea. If you back up to chapter 1, look at chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, where this idea of fullness appears. It says that he, God, put all things in subjection under his feet, at his Christ's feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There's a sense in which God's body, you and me, being members of the body, Christ being the head, we are members, his fullness is somehow being imparted to us and through us to the world. Still begs the question, well, how? What does that mean? What is this added dimension? What is the fullness? We'll jump ahead to chapter 3. And I'll start in um, verse 14. Remember the prayer of Paul? We looked at it in detail. I spent a few weeks on it. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, there's the idea of love, rooted and grounded in love, Verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So there's the fullness of God and it's associated with love. Do you see that? It's this idea of God supernaturally opening our eyes to see his character, to see what he's like, to see that he is filled with love, that God has infinite love for his creation and for his creatures. To know the love of Christ is to be filled up with the fullness of God. So when we get to this point in chapter 4, and he says he is, he is spreading his fullness around this world through his body, how is he doing it? How is he doing it through apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers? Here's how he's doing it. He is conveying this message of his amazing love. He is conveying his gospel truth. He is helping us to see that behind everything we experience in creation, the great things like a, a 
an amazing day hiking around the woods and enjoying the beauty of creation. The best things and even the worst things natural disasters and hardships and all the, the um, ills of society, the things that we're seeing play out on the news with the constant battles in our cities that it's, I mean, keeps happening over and over again with the clashes between the police and the rioters and all the chaos going on. In all, behind all of that is a God who is over his creation, who who loves his creation, who loves the people within his creation, who allows us certain degrees of freedom, and with that we do, unfortunately, horrible things. And it speaks to the deficit in human love. Even even though we can experience love in certain ways, it's always lacking, it's always limited, there's always strings attached, it's always fleeting, and, 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 and God is revealing himself. He has been doing it from the beginning of time. He is still doing it. And what this is saying is through his people, he is still conveying this message of his love. And when you read on and it talks about us maturing and us understanding, look what it says. As a result, we are no longer to be children. This is verse 14. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But instead, speaking the truth in love. There it is again. In love we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself. Here it is again. In love. You see that over and over again. In love, in love, in love, in love. So this has to do with the body, the body working together, every member being important, you being important, me being important, fulfilling a certain role in all in the program of God. And and while we may we may hear this and think that somehow, okay, this has to do with this, maybe this enablement, this supernatural power to become some kind of moral hero. I think I used to see it that way, but but more and more what I'm seeing this conveying is not that somehow we are innately better than others or that we're even necessarily always more moral than others or that we even, you know, see everything more clearly than others. No, that's not the case. But what God is showing us, what we are privileged to see more and more with greater clarity as God works in our lives, as we are able to see who he is, what he's really like. And as he works that into our lives, he supernaturally empowers us to share that with others who are inherently human like us and who need to know that behind all this is not nothing and no one, but something and someone, a personal God, a good God, who's a redeemer, who's a rescuer, that reference to the psalm here, which is speaking of the one who comes and he takes captives and makes them his own captives. I mean, all that history of Israel, God was showing and revealing himself certain things. Well, now as time has gone on, it becomes more and more clear that what that was pointing to was the spiritual deliverance of God's people through Christ. And now we're left here to say to other people, hey, this is who God is. This is what God offers. This is the deliverance The deliverance from what? The deliverance from our lack of ability to see and respond to a loving God with love. Our lack of ability to do that. Our lack of ability to love others. Our human stuckness in our selfishness and all of our biases. I was reading last night for a number of different reasons, but reading about these psychological categories of cognitive biases, and there are a great number of them. And they all have to do with how we are completely self-absorbed and how we misinterpret things. And and one is, um, I might butcher the name of this, I think it's like hostility bias. And Jill and I were talking about just how we just, we don't see things and and, and our, our inability to see goodness in God and even the goodness of God through people, we just have an inability to see that so often. And we, we, we we're talking about this example of this one, this, uh, I think it's called like assumed hostility bias, something like that. But it's basically the idea that you can, you can think that someone else is being hostile toward you, even though they might not even be thinking about you at all. And there was this example 
that Jill came up with happened maybe a few years ago. We were in the grocery store, Jill and I together, and we bumped into one of our neighbors. And previously, we had talked to her a whole bunch out there on the street of our neighborhood. Her kids played with our kids. And so we knew her. Well, we, we bumped into her, and she was very cold to us and seemed to be, like, angry. And, and we both left, and like, whoa, and, and felt like, and I'm, I was going through my head, like, boy, the last interaction we had, I think it did go a little bit weirdly. And it's like, well, maybe we, you know, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe she's ticked at us. And that's kind of what we were both assuming. So we're attributing to her some kind of hostility toward us, okay? That's where we went with that narrative. Interestingly, a few days later, Jill happened to bump into her again. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, I know I saw you guys the other day. I was just in a really bad mood. And I felt like when I saw you guys, I knew that you were two people I didn't have to fake it with. So I was just in a bad mood. Sorry about that. Some things had happened. Had nothing to do with us. She was saying she actually likes us, and she was glad she didn't have to fake it with us. I think that was a good thing. But do you see how we can ru- I can run with that narrative? Listen, th- th- this whole idea of being tossed to and fro, like we are so impressionable. We are so, e- we are sheeple, right? We're so easily led and misled. And man, I don't know. It, it feels like in my lifetime, and it's, again, this is subjective according to my view of what's happening in our world, but it, like it's never been more important to understand clearly human nature as it is now, at least in our culture, if we're thinking about temporal implications of what's happening or consequences of what's happening. I mean, it's so important to understand human nature and along with it to understand God's nature, God's character, and, and God has not left himself without witness. He's revealed himself to us through his word, through, I mean, the Apostle Paul. Here we are, thousands of years later, reading what he recorded for us here, which displays, which unfolds before us the beautiful heart of our good creator, God. And now he has us here, in one way or another, sharing of his fullness, sharing with people that other dimension of life, that there's more to it, there's more to this. It's not vanity and empty. It's not meaningless. And that all the problems we have, all these deficits of love, are pointers to the God of love and how much we need Him. There's so much to do with, with, God's, with God's love. And just a few more, a few more observations here. When He says, we are no longer to be children, you know, ignorant, tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, craftiness and deceitful scheming, all that. I mean, those words just speak of deception, lies, being stuck there, but instead speaking the truth in love. And interestingly, when he says, hey, this, this, is, the, this is the body, this is, this is what God is up to in the body, is it's an environment for literally it's truthing in love. It's been translated speaking the truth in love. It may have to do with speaking the truth in love, but I even read where one, one uh, biblical scholar said this. Listen to this explanation of this idea of speaking the truth in love, which again, is the word speaking is not in the original. It's truthing in love. It says, in Ephesians, the concept of being truthful is the best sense of the word. In contrast to the preceding verses, where there are three phrases denoting falsehood and deceit, the present word speaks of being real or truthful in both conduct and speech. In other words, the believer's conduct should be transparent, revealing the real estate of affairs as opposed to hiding or suppressing the truth through cunning and deceit. As we say so often, the gospel as we understand it, invites us into the light to see what's true about human nature, to see what's true about God, to see what's true about our, all of our deficits in the area of true love as defined by God, not as we humanly define it, but as defined by God, as it really is, to see our deficits in those areas and to see God's provision in those areas, to see God's completeness and perfection in those areas, to see Christ and to have worship for Him because we see He, he is the one, all of us, in one sense, ought to be but are not. 
cannot be. He is the righteous one. He is the God in flesh. He is the God imminent. Speaking the truth in love, this is now what fits for God's people is to just to be honest, to be truthful about those things. Not that we're necessarily in any way or not that we are better, but that God is graciously revealing himself to us. And along with that, he is teaching us of human nature and he's teaching us of all these deceptions. And there are so many and there, that's nothing. There's nothing new under the sun. But when you I guess I would just say I in terms of the pressing need and I know I've got my limitations and, and I'm sure I don't see everything clearly. But boy, it seems real important how we understand human nature these days with the different ideologies and philosophies being spread around our world. And you see some of the consequences of those things and what they say about freedom, personal freedom, national freedom. So many implications. Thankfully, we have a God who's told us the truth. Told us the truth. And he has us here collectively. There's all this collective language. We're a temple, we're a body, we're a family. And every joint is supplying. And we are growing together, being built up in love. That's an awesome concept. And, and I, see, um, I see you as a part of that. And I even mean you individually in a in variety of ways that you serve. And, and some of you may be aware of it. Some of you may not be aware of it. But each one important, each one fits, each one having a role, and God has determined all that, and God is up to all that. We don't have to obsess over it. It's just saying, hey, this is what he's, this is what he's doing. He's building us up. Every joint is supplying. Every individual important, and Christ is the head. He's the authority. He's over all. And so in him, we are invited into a state of lowliness, um, a healthy, as we say a lot, a healthy sense of self-doubt, not a woe is me, Morbid, miserable introspection, but a healthy sense of self-doubt. Sometimes concluding with us questioning our morbid introspection, like the, the healthy kind of just, hey, God is big, I am small. God knows, I don't. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? He is the one who sees all things clearly. He is the one in whom the fullness dwells. He is the one who is love and who has this message and provision of love through the person and work of Jesus. He is the one who is opening our eyes to see what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ. He is the one who has given us his spirit, has secured us, has inseparably joined us to himself and who holds us and who is committed to building us up together. And now we get to live in light of who God is. That's what, that's what this boils down to. I hope that's, uh, I hope that's encouraging to you as it's been encouraging to me. Let me close in prayer here. Okay. Father, thank you for the time we've had this morning in Sunday school and here in this sermon, this message from Ephesians, which you inspired Paul to write thousands of years ago. It's so needed today as we stumble around in this world and so often bang into each other and fail in so many ways to be, to be loving to, to you, to be grateful to you. We're so seldom grateful um, because of our blinders and our de- deception and then with our behavior toward others so often self-absorbed and self-interested and exploiting others and taking advantage or hurting in ways that we don't even realize we're doing. We're so in need of of your grace. We're so in need of your revelation. We need you to show us. We need you to open our eyes to see that you are the God over all, the God who is in all, through all, that your fullness has been shared in this world and we bump into those thoughts so often of emptiness and vanity and dissatisfaction and insecurity and instability, which we so often do. We ask that you'd please remind us of what is true about yourself and your good news of your gospel, that Jesus, who was above, descended into this world, into the lower parts to to deal with even the worst that this world has to offer, to subject himself to it, 
to suffer, to even become a victim of human violence and aggression toward you, to subject himself to that, to willingly do so, and to do so as a substitute, to do so in our place, to do so to take upon himself our curse and what we deserve, and then to impart to us the infinite treasure of your love, the gifts of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, all ours. So we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for helping us in this hour to hear. Uh, thank you for opening our eyes to see. And we, uh, we look to you as we think about our role in this world, God. Just use us as you wish. Help us to use the gifts and abilities you've given to serve and to even share the good news of who you are with people who desperately need it, the hope of who you are with people who desperately need it. So thank you again for this truth. Thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, my friends who are here this morning. Thank you for this church and what you've done to, to sustain it.